I thought the hauntings of the titular room were really, really good, but I would have liked if it did a little bit more with that. I think until the ceiling fan fell down and you could no longer regenerate just by staying in the room, it felt too much like a safe haven. And that's another big horror no-no. The moment you're confident, the moment you feel safe, that's when the fear starts to go away some. I mean, I liked how it was a bit of a safe haven until that point. I mean, I liked how it provided this seemingly infinite fountain of health up to that point and then snatched it away. That's effective. Similar to how in the second one you suddenly, for a short period, had to dump all of your stuff. I mean, even the light and the radio to go on the elevator and there were still monsters down there, you know, and now you just had to run and you wouldn't be warned by the static and you wouldn't have the light. That's a really effective tool and I just wish that they had used it a little more in the game. The fourth one, that is. I love how at first you can just maybe see the stuffed animal rabbit on her bed, Eileen's bed, through the hole in the wall, and then after she disappears and you think, has she really died? It starts pointing at you, like accusing you, and you see that it has like blood on it and it looks an awful lot like one of the ones from the third one, you know, from the park. You know, the, the carnival area. I do think that the last portion of the game bears some marks from the characters not having been developed. All you know about Eileen is her first name and that she's your next door neighbor and you don't know anything about Henry either. I mean, all that's binding either of them to the other is, you know, the milk of human kindness. I mean, yes, Harry Mason was not that developed of a character, but he had a parent's love of their child. Well, their adopted child, anyway. I also think that the cutting back and forth between Henry and Eileen in the final fight is a bit distracting. Also because sometimes you have to readjust to what direction you're suddenly supposed to be running in. And did those rings remind anyone else of the big ball in Event Horizon? Some of the enemies in this one were just kind of silly, like the monkeys and the self-rolling wheelchairs. And a couple of them seemed to be a tad too similar with just several creatures that walked on their hands instead of having legs. And also, I mean, the insect bats? Are you serious? What next? A pigeon rat? And I also personally thought that the ghosts, as cool as it was that they were all Walter Sullivan's victims, were just irritating. It makes good sense that all four of these have you exploring a hospital. They're just creepy in a way, you know? I think it's interesting to note how these gradually move further away from Sound Hill, the town itself. I mean, the first one, definitively, Sound Hill. You go to the town and something's happening, they are at the town. The second one, you go to the town and the resident magic of the area calls forth these manifestations. The third one, you don't even start in Silent Hill. You just go there after Harry, your father, has been murdered. I mean, I might be a little bit off, but isn't about half the game before you even get to Silent Hill? Maybe even a little more than half? And the fourth one, you're not really in Silent Hill. Henry's been there, he's taken photos there, and at least some of the worlds are Silent Hill. The subway world isn't really, for example. But, you know, they have to think of something new, and after three different reasons for going to Sound Hill, they had a game where you don't go to Sound Hill. And I haven't played it yet, and I don't know the plot, but I think that's why they called the fifth one Homecoming. You know, kind of saying in the title, yes, this one takes place in Silent Hill. Which, again, I'm just presuming it does. I don't know. It's like in the Alien franchise, you know, the third one killed off the alien queen that was in the story, and the fourth one is then called Resurrection, you know, signaling to the audience, Yes, we bring it back! Don't worry, there are aliens in this movie. About the four games on the whole, I love that there are different endings that you can actually lose if you don't do well enough in the game that you can get a bad ending, you know. I think that's it for the game franchise, so... The movie. I suppose this is a nitpick and not really the film's fault, but is it just me or was it kind of awkward how they had to work in, you know, search engines and cell phones? 
I like that she found a map near the beginning. That was a nice little touch. I think one of the problems with the film is that there are just way too many people. It doesn't have the feeling of solitude. I don't personally think that it really added to the story that Alessa was raped. I mean, I'm not some prude from the Victorian age who can't stand when a risque subject is covered in a movie. I just don't think it added anything. Now, I agree that there is some ambiguity over who the father was, but can someone explain where the evil came from? I mean, in the games, they did a ritual, that was why the kid was burned, and that's why she has all these powers. In the movie, she gets burned by accident, and her hate started to change the world around her? What? How does that happen? How does that work? You know, was she really a witch? If so, then that takes away the whole chilling aspect of them burning people who they think are witches. Now, the movie did teach us a few things. For example, Pyramid Head would be an excellent butcher. I mean, just look at the skinning job he does on Anna, or whatever her name is. And also, and also, when the people he's chasing are in a small room with no way out, he's gonna take the T-1000 elevator approach to the situation. I also thought it was really obnoxious how this film felt the need to pretty much come out and say, yes, this is the devil's work. And if you don't think it was the devil, then please explain to me what did the line, I have many names, mean? What, unless it was a Shakespeare fan, big into Romeo and Juliet? Did anyone else think that Sharon Alessa looked a lot like a younger version of that chick who plays Lana Lang on Smallville? The scene of the slaughter in the church? What place does that have in anything related to Sound Hill? I mean, the tearing apart of, I think it was Annabella, that was just too gory and bloody and not scary. I will say that a lot of the acting was really good and the kid was phenomenal. Why was she seemingly going to jump down that enormous hole I mean, I get that the other world, or what it's called, the other world, or what it's called, alternate Silent Hill, was forming down there for some reason. But wouldn't it just have killed her? She was saying, "I want to go home, Silent Hill, Silent Hill." What can the town produce? Warp zones. Also, what on earth did the kid have to do with anything? Yes, she was all that was left of the good in Alessa. I get that, and they sent her away for some reason, I don't know. But really, all they wanted was her adoptive mother, who doesn't have anything to do with Silent Hill. They just needed a person who didn't believe in the witchcraft accusation that, that Alessa had gotten. I don't know, could they only contact Sharon? Do they have some kind of supernatural tap on her where they can see if she has a mother? Why did they wait so long anyway? Well, I guess she had to enunciate well enough for them to pick up that she was saying Silent Hill, or they wouldn't have any clue where to take her who actually takes their child by themselves to some place that they don't know that the internet warns them about without telling anyone. Beforehand, anyway. All she did was leave that note or something. Why did Rose have to memorize the way? Couldn't she just borrow pen and pad from Sybil? Why did Sybil sacrifice herself? Wow, was that a noisy and completely out of place for anything Silent Hill related elevator. It's like if Silent Hill is a ghost story and someone who you expect to tell you a ghost story walks up to you and just gives you a good shaking. That's not gonna scare you, that's just weird and out of place and not the ghost story that you came for. I totally get the nurses with the perfect bodies and the busts with cleavage and all, but why were they breakdancing? Why were they a bigger risk to each other than to Rose? Did anyone really think that someone activated by light like that would be scary and not goofy? Is it just me or was the reveal at the end really dragged out? I mean, I knew long before they showed us that they weren't in the same place. Clearly, look at the color, look at the fog. It's not the same house. And why was Sean Bean seemingly happy or smiling at the end? Is it just me, or did the fact that Rose was running around Sound Hill and not walking maybe take away from the mood and the atmosphere some? Am I the only one who was sorely disappointed when it turned out that it was just Dahlia who had hidden Sharon? Seriously, this movie had too much explaining. I'm not kidding. At the hour and a half point, I practically yelled at the screen, Stop explaining! Why did Annabelle send Rose down there? What did she expect her to do? Did she not realize that the evil could come back with her? Why did Rose accept? What was she expecting to gain from it? Was it Alessa's plan for Rose to get stabbed when she got back? 